Good afternoon, and thank you all for joining us. I'm Mary Pat Higgins, President and CEO of the Dallas Holocaust and Human Rights Museum. We gather today to commemorate International Holocaust Remembrance Day, officially observed on January 27th each year. As has been true for so many of our traditions recently, today's program looks different than it usually does because we cannot be together in person. While we have felt the impact of this distance to varying degrees over the past 10 months, we perhaps feel it most keenly on days like today. Today, as we come together to remember the victims of the Holocaust, lives extinguished because of unfounded hatred, I wish we could be together at the museum. But if we have learned anything from our survivors, it is to have faith. And I have faith that we will be together soon. On January 27, 1945, Soviet troops liberated Auschwitz-Birkenau, the largest Nazi death camp. Between 1942 and 1944, over one million people were murdered there, the vast majority of them Jews. In 2005, the United Nations designated January 27th as a Remembrance Day to honor all victims of the Holocaust. Upon issuing the resolution, the UN urged member states to develop educational programs to instill the memory of the tragedy in future generations to prevent genocide from occurring again. 
Last year, we marked the 75th anniversary of the liberation of Auschwitz-Birkenau and thousands of other camps near the end of World War II. This vast network of concentration camps was a key cog in the Nazi death machine that killed millions of innocent people, men, women, and children, Jews and Christians, homosexuals, Roma, Sinti, and Laleri, and people with disabilities. Today, we honor and remember each of those lives. We also acknowledge that genocide continues to occur even to this day. Just this week, the United States asserted that China is committing genocide against Uyghur Muslims, an ethnic and religious minority group that has suffered years of oppression and violence at the hands of its own government. We must continue to educate, to build awareness, and to promote human rights for all people regardless of race, ethnicity, faith, or background. We must redouble our efforts to ensure never again rings true. The museum's mission is to teach the history of the Holocaust and advance human rights to combat prejudice, hatred, and indifference. It is realized as we welcome visitors to the museum to learn about the Holocaust, other genocides, and human and civil rights in our own country and challenge them to be upstanders in their communities. It is realized every time a student hears the firsthand testimony of a Holocaust survivor. It is realized through our programming for the community and through our workshops for teachers and professionals. And it is realized on days like today when we gather to remember the past, acknowledge the present, and look to the future with hope. Anti-Semitism is on the rise in this country and around the world. From Pittsburgh to Poway, Paris to Halle, we have watched acts of senseless violence unfold. We have seen a mob force their way into the Capitol displaying anti-Semitic symbols and a large swastika painted on a parking garage in our own downtown. But as I feel the support of our community today, I know we have the tools to combat anti-Semitism and hatred and to help each other understand that our strength lies in our differences. I hope you will all join me as we work to create a community of upstanders. And today I'd like to recognize a very important group of upstanders in our community, our survivors. These men and women are the heart and soul of our museum. They educate us, they enlighten us, and they remind us every day of the best of humanity. I appreciate you all being here to help us celebrate and honor them. As you all joined our program today, you saw the names of our local DFW survivors, hidden children, refugees, and kinder transportees. I would now like to take a moment to remember the survivors we lost in 2020. Irma Freudenreich, Francis Kirstner, Jack Rapp, Lily Wider, Helmut Wolf. May their memory be for a blessing. I'd like to extend a special thanks to Rabbi Deborah Robbins of Temple Emmanuel and Reverend Barbara Markham of Lover's Lane United Methodist Church for being with us. Today, regardless of faith, regardless of ethnicity, regardless of background, we come together as one to remember the victims of the Holocaust. I would now like to invite Reverend Markham and Rabbi Robbins to share a short prayer and light a memorial candle. If you have a candle with you at home, we invite you to light it as we share a moment of remembrance. This time as my prayer, I will read a statement from Dietrich Bonhoeffer, who just two weeks before the liberation of the prison camp in which he, he was working served, he was hanged, uh, first tried and then hanged, but hear these words about remembering those that we, we love who have gone. There is nothing that can replace the absence of someone dear to us and one should not even attempt to do so. 
One must simply hold out and endure it. At first, that sounds very hard, but at the same time, it's also a great comfort. For to the extent the emptiness truly remains unfilled, one remains connected to the other person through it. It's wrong to say that God fills the emptiness. God in no way fills it, but much more leaves it precisely unfilled and thus helps us to preserve, even in our pain, the authentic relationship. Amen. And now invite all of you to light your candle as Rabbi Robbins lights one candle for all who died in the Holocaust. With candles lit, I invite you to please join me in giving voice to this memorial prayer for all people who died in the Holocaust. From wherever you are, we join our voices together. Let there be perfect rest for the souls of the six million who died as Jews in the flames of the Shoah. Let there be perfect rest for the countless millions who died because of race, religion, or nationality, political affiliation, or sexual orientation. Hold them close to you forever. Seal their souls for everlasting life in the shelter of your presence, for you are their eternal home. And together we say, Amen. Amen. I first learned about the Holocaust when I was in the sixth grade. My synagogue Sunday school class watched the movie Night and Fog. If you've seen it, you know the black and white newsreel footage of the concentration camps, the horrifying walking skeletons and the nauseating piles of human belongings. Like the footage, the victims and the perpetrators, along with the historical narrative, were portrayed as was the practice in 1970s synagogues, also in black and white. Six million Jews died. The Nazis, led by Adolf Hitler, organized and carried out the murders. With time, I learned history was not black and white. The Holocaust took the lives of at least 11 million people. A single leader did not commit all those crimes against humanity. Even bystanders were guilty. The Holocaust wasn't something that happened suddenly. Hatred, intolerance, lies, violent behaviors in private and public were acceptable and celebrated. And I, as I learned more, pledged, like so many of you, never again. Thank God we now have the Dallas, the Dallas Holocaust and Human Rights Museum and this International Holocaust Remembrance Day to help us all understand the Holocaust, the historic human rights issues of our country, and the contemporary ones around our world. None of them are black and white. These memories came flooding back to me on January 6th. American thugs storming the Capitol building in Washington, DC, not only in an attempt to overturn a free and fair election, but to move forward and normalize the beliefs of white supremacy. I saw men wearing Auschwitz work camp t-shirts and others with the code 6KNE emblazoned across their chests. The mob fueled by the same hatred and intolerance of the 1940s sought to cleanse the world of so many who make society rich with diversity. Those who identify as LGBTQ 
those with varied faith traditions worshiping in varied ways, those whose outward appearance or family tree didn't match up with enough white skin, blonde hair, or blue eyes. It was like watching a pogrom in my living room. My heart was racing. I couldn't believe it. It was happening. It was here again. The following Sunday, perhaps you saw, the New York Times printed two small photographs on the front page. Broken windows and shattered glass at the Capitol. They could have been from Kristallnacht, the night of broken glass in 1938. But they were taken only four days earlier at a place that I had visited many times to respectfully express my opinions to those in power, to celebrate the freedoms that make our country my home. I felt horror and pain and fear. The similarities to the Holocaust felt far too close. But I also felt a tiny bit of renewed energy and commitment to stand up and to speak out for truth and justice with compassion and strength, to look for the helpers, as Mr. Rogers has taught us, and to look for the hope. I found hope knowing this event was coming. I would be with other students of history, others who had pledged never again. I would know as a Jew and as an American, I am not alone even as I work from home, isolated in this pandemic. And I found hope in our Torah cycle. Since the start of January, we've been reading in the Jewish community from the book of Exodus, inspirational narratives where bold and brave women save the lives of others, where leaders, who seek, out, where leaders seek out partners and together speak truth to power. It celebrates men and women who raise their voices and people who work together for a higher purpose. It's a story of freedom, freedom from slavery, release from a place of narrow thinking, redemption from oppression of all sorts. I found hope because the Exodus call for freedom is not for individuals. It is not so each person can make their own decisions about liberty. No, it's so a society, our world, will include freedoms for all people. I found hope because the biblical call for freedom is, as one commentator suggests, not freedom from something, it is freedom for something. It is freedom for service to God and others. It is freedom to enter the wilderness where transformation can happen, where hope bears fruit. We are always in that wilderness in every generation. And in every generation, we learn again that we can only make our way together students of history and the heart toward a place and a time where intolerance and hate are condemned, where truth triumphs, where equality is evident, where hope inspires and all people are free. And together we move our world closer to wholeness and peace. Thank you so much, Rabbi Robbins. I'd now like to invite Reverend Markham to share some remarks. Thank you, thank you, Deborah. Every night as a child, and it was like clout work, uh, I was tucked into bed by my parents. And as they would head to the door, they would turn off the light on the wall. And there was a sudden darkness. 
and the darkness frightened me as a child. Um, it was scary. Uh, but within a minute or two, my eyes would adjust to the darkness and I felt uh, grounded as I saw a small sliver of, of light that would go under my door. Uh, it allowed me just to focus and not be as afraid and to calm myself. One small beam of light did this for me as a child. Several times in the last century, the world has witnessed a depth of darkness. Uh, it's been unimaginable. It's come from natural disasters and some has come at the hands of sinister personalities. There were 20 million deaths during World War I. This was followed by the 1918-1919 pandemic where uh, it just ran rampant over our globe and there were over 50 million people who died. One of every, one of every three persons who was infected with the virus died. As the nations of the world promised after World, I, world War I never to have another war again as such, I, and all, also the crisis of the pandemic of 18, um, Hitler though in the 30s and the 40s um, began to rise and he meticulously um, and slowly began to unite the German people in a sense of strength and of power. It was six million Jews lost their lives uh, because of this uh, for a total of 11 million uh, of the other important groups who lost their lives as well. Now, 75 years later, uh, time has passed and the world is again in a world pandemic. It's a disaster of an enormous uh, proportion and we look to one another for support and, and knowledge. One year following the outbreak of COVID, we hear of the worldwide devastation of 2 million women, men, children to this virus. But around the world, there have been 90, over 90 million people who have been infected and over now 2 million deaths. As we remember the Holocaust and realize after these 12 months that our world has lost 2 million people, um, that we can then get a sense of the devastation uh, post-war, World War II, when we realized there were six million Jews who died. And so these two million is, is but a third at this time of the people of uh, the Jewish uh, population who died. Uh, our perspective of the world will never be the same because of our current pandemic, for we have known isolation on our continent for the first time, and we wait for light to come into our world. The 1918 flu epidemic, along with the 2020 COVID pandemic were natural disasters, while the Holocaust, as we all know, was the result of human evil and aggression and the deep need for power. Over the entry gates at Auschwitz are written in German the words, um, work will make you free. Now we all know that the work never made them free and in fact they were victimized as much when they got there and more. At the entry of another uh, site of memorial that I viewed in Eastern Europe, it said more appropriately, beyond these walls, the ground cries. You know, most of us cannot comprehend the idea of the death of 6 million Jews or 11 million uh, inclusive all. Only when we walk through one of the rooms in Auschwitz one of the block cells and we see the rooms that are filled from floor, some to ceiling, but uh, very high. And these are rooms filled with eyeglasses. They're filled with hairbrushes. There are rooms filled with teeth. There are rooms filled with hair. There are rooms filled with shoes, rooms filled with dolls. For the first time in my life, I came to realize the light that was connected to each one of those items. And as we look on the thousands upon thousands of wire rim spectacles in the one room, I began to imagine the life uh, 
that looked through those spectacles and the view and the world and the landscape that they saw for each wear. I came to learn of the Nazi party's rise to power in my own home. My mother's father was a first generation Jewish immigrant family from Lithuania. My father, on the other hand, was a 24 year old American pilot in World War II who was shot down by enemy gunfire over Romania. He did not talk about the war often, but I always knew that he was held captive, he suffered, uh, and upon liberation returned to the United States to a Miami hospital where he was in rehab for many, many months. I watched in my life as he read book after book about the rise of Nazis, regime and he watched the documentaries on World War II. I learned from watching my parents focus on the rise of Hitler that we all have to remember it and that that is our job is to pass the story to the next generation. And with the recent rise even more of white supremacy that we have witnessed in the last weeks, it is even more vital. My father spoke of the nights when he would go to the window in the prison camp to watch the raids with mortar fire lighting up the skies. To see the planes in the nighttime skies gave my father and the others around him hope. Maybe the end would come someday. And when the war ended and the gates in the prison, of the prison camp were opened and they were left alone, it was the light of day that took them and helped them to take their first fragile steps toward freedom. Work did not make them free, but the resistance and the unrelenting struggle of the world's people brought them freedom. I was taught to know the history, to speak the truth, and to resist the cult of personality in any aspiring leader Leaders must speak the truth to their people and people must speak the truth to their leaders. Today, we join together in our homes with our light and we're here to honor victims of the Holocaust and to celebrate the individuals and the descendants of individuals of these the bravest souls, both living and dead. The candlelight reminds us of the power of light coming into our darkness. We lift up our lights to the men and the women who resisted. We lift up our lights and our hearts to those who rescued others, risking their own life and limb for the safety. And we celebrate the men and the women, the boys and the girls who displayed acts of kindness in those in their path. Together, you and I must be those who continue to share the light in the dark. And we do it in the areas of our own lives. And we must bear witness to those who live through the Holocaust because we know how many deniers that there are. I never imagined that our homeland would fear the onslaught of domestic terrorism until the last few weeks. So all of us must bear witness through history and through facts and through sharing. We cannot allow distortions, misinformation, and denials to perpetuate, as we heard one senator say on January 6th. In our own community, neighborhoods, social groups, houses of worship, we are called to speak up and we are to speak out for the remembrance of the Holocaust and we have to speak for truth's sake in our own country when there are people who rise up and seek power unjustly. We must speak truth to lies and risk rejection by our own circles. We must bring that slither, that small essence of light to the dark situations and the dark discussions that we are part of. And only when we offer our light However small can we ever overshadow the darkness and give grounding to others. Two weeks ago, I was in the American section of the Dallas Holocaust Museum, and it is a room that has Texas upstanders in areas of social justice, uh, rights of 
related to rights of women, uh, of African Americans, of Asians, of, of many, many groups who have had to make their way toward equality. In the room that day, a, a young mother brought in her child. The child sat at one of the multimedia centers. The mother went to a wall and began to read one of the, the testimonies. Then I heard the small eight-year-old child's reading to his mother about one of, uh, of the great liberators in the uh, African community in Texas. And as his re mother, he read, his mother walked over, put her hands on his shoulder. And I was so touched for I thought as they left uh, that this child is going to be one of those lights that's going to ground others in years to come and in his life and circle. I brought a small votive to light as a reminder that it only takes a small flame or a sliver to ground us and to give each one of us our perspective, our light on the world. We are the ones to share the light. We must be strong and we need to share the light in the darkest situations. Always lift up your light, be the light to your circle of influence and your world. Amen. Thank you so much, Reverend Markham. I would now like to invite Rabbi Robbins to say Kaddish. It's traditional when one recites the Kaddish to stand, to affirm our gratitude to God for life and for light and to give thanks for the lives of those who are no longer with us. That can be sometimes difficult to do on Zoom. So we invite you either to stand or to find yourself in a more upright seated position, mindful of the light that you have lit in your home perhaps this afternoon as you've joined us, mindful of the light that I have here um, with me, mindful of the light we each carry forward in our hearts um, on this day. And uh, before we recite the Kaddish, I do want to I want to thank Reverend Markham and I want to thank the Dallas Holocaust Museum, um, Holocaust and Human Rights Museum for giving us this opportunity to be together and to affirm the light that can be, that must be in our world. Please join me. Yit Gadal v'yit Kadash Shemei Rabbah. Ve'alma divra chirute ve'amlich malchute. Bachayechon uv'yomechon uv'chaye d'cho beit Yisrael. Bagala uv'izman kariv v'imru. Amen. Yehe shme raba mivorach leolam ulome almaya. Yit barach v'yish tabach v'yit pa'ar v'yit ramam v'yit nase. V'yit adar v'yit ale v'yit halal. Shme de kudasha v'richu. Le'ela min ko birchata v'shirata. Tushbechata v'nechemata. Damiran b'alma v'imru. Amen. Yehe shlama raba min shamaya v'chayim. Aleinu v'al kol Yisrael v'imru. Amen. Ose shalom b'mramav. Hu yase shalom. Aleinu v'al kol Yisrael v'imru. Amen. May the one who makes peace in the high places bring peace upon us, upon all Israel, indeed upon all the world. And we say together, Amen. Thank you, Rabbi Robbins and Rabbi Markham for sharing your inspirational words. And thank you all for joining us today to remember the victims of the Holocaust and honor our survivors. We hope to see you soon.